I was asked to do a video on the powers and duties of trustees and so this is just really quite a short video just to give you some of the key ideas. You might have to go away and do some other research yourself but hopefully after watching this video you'll have a key understanding for this part of equity and trusts. So with that in mind let's get started by thinking about what exactly are powers and duties. So what do we mean by duties and powers in the context of a trust? Well, whereas a duty is something that has to be exercised by the trustee, in other words, they have to do it, a power is something that can be exercised by the trustee. In other words, they have the option to not necessarily have to exercise that particular power. Now, there are a couple of caveats associated with this. So whereas a trustee does have to exercise a duty, the way in which they do so is sort of up to them, and so they are given a lot of discretion in that sense. On the other hand, whereas powers are optional, for want of a better word, in cases of discretionary trusts, a power may have to be exercised by the trustee. In other words, that option is taken away. So that's definitely something to look out for. Now, this idea of discretion that we've talked about does also have its own legal meaning, so we'll try and explore that. In particular, the recent case of Pitt and Holt, which is really important, it tells us that trustees do still have to act in good faith when exercising their discretion. They also have to act responsibly, reasonably, based on the facts. So this means looking at things like the type of trust that they're involved in. If it's something like pensions, then they should maybe only make low risk investments, whereas if they're trying to make as much money as possible, then the trustees are probably more inclined to make high risk investments. And they often have to act on the advice of experts in particular areas. And that might be things like scientists or people like that. But more often than not, it's going to be thinking about things like accountants to consider which is the um, option which gives them the best tax benefits for their particular type of trusts. And also lawyers for exercising some of those duties and powers as well. So some important points there when it comes to exercising discretion. And this is really important because... While trustees don't have to give reasons for their decisions, the courts are only going to step in when the trustees have acted in bad faith. In other words, where they've not met that criteria that we just talked about in the case of Pitt and Holt. And that comes from the case of Clug and Clug from 1918. And while they don't have to give reasons for their decisions, if they do decide to give reasons for their decisions, then that is something that can be looked at by the court when considering whether the trustees did act in bad faith or not. And that comes from Clug and Clug as well from 1918. What about the cases of bad advice? Well, in previous case law, mistakes which were based on bad advice, say for example, you want to find out which um, type of uh, trust is going to give you the best tax advantage and an accountant gives you bad advice that the trustee then acts upon. Well, that in that type of situation, the trustee has essentially taken into account irrelevant considerations and so that mistake could essentially be undone by the courts and that comes from the case of Re Hastings Bass from 1975. However, this all changed thanks to the previous case that we mentioned of Pitt and Holt from 2013. And this says that a decision that's based on bad advice will still stand if the trustees acted with appropriate care and diligence. In other words, if the trustees have acted in good faith, then it's not going to be for the courts to get involved and um, basically fix that mistake for the trustees. So this creates potential problem for beneficiaries who are trying to find a remedy. Um, but there is perhaps an indirect remedy against the person who gave the bad advice. So you might be thinking about something like professional negligence against the accountant in the example we described. Or there may be a direct remedy based on mistake but that's a little bit harder to prove and so not necessarily ideal so on the one hand in this decision in Pitt and Holt the courts have sort of upheld the decisions of trustees and allowed them greater discretion but it's taken away some of the remedies available to a beneficiary if a mistake has been made. So let's get into the core of the duties and the powers as well so we'll start with the duties these are sort of the most powerful things, the things that the trustees actually have to do. And the first basic thing that they have to do is actually provide information to the beneficiaries. That can be things like documentation that relates to the trust or relates to the property. Basically, any relevant documentation or information has to be provided. And that comes from Re-Londonderry Settlement 
from 1965. Secondly, the trustees have to act impartially between the different beneficiaries. There may be different relationships between the beneficiaries. It might be like a 60-40 relationship between the beneficiaries, but they still should act appropriately in that regard. And this often comes up in the cases of property, in particular thinking about life tenant and remainderman. Um, just to give you a little bit of context there, a life tenant is someone who can essentially use a property for all of their life, and the remainderman is the person who gets the property after the life tenant does pass away. And so when you think about that, they have to think about whether, for example, to sell the property. Now, if that's done while the life tenant is alive, then that obviously benefits the life tenant, but it may um, not be beneficial for the remainderman. And so the trustee in that situation has to try and balance the two sides together, consider whether they should sell the property, and if they do so, how much the life tenant should get and how much the remainderman should get as well. The main duty comes from Section 1.1 of the Trustee Act 2000. And this is really talking about a duty of care. And essentially what it's talking about here is that the trustee basically has to act with such care and skill in the circumstances, having regard to things like special knowledge or experience that they may have either as a trustee or perhaps as someone who has a legal background, for example. Um, and that's kind of the core of the duty that came in in the year 2000, because under the previous law, it was mostly based around 19th and early 20th century case law that was simply outdated. And so I've um, basically put section 1.1 of the 2000 Act there, so that you have a good idea about what the new duty of care is for trustees. So where does this duty of care actually apply to in the context of being a trustee? Well, we've got there, so investments and compounding. Compounding just means increasing the value of property or investments, acquiring land, appointments such as other trustees, for example, reversions where the property returns back to the settler, the person who created the trust in the first place, Valuations, audits, insurance, all that type of thing is where the duty of care will apply. Section 1.1 of the Trustee Act 2000 is backed up by sections 3, 4 and 5. Section 3 basically just says a trustee can make any investment that he is allowed to under the trust, so gives them a bit of discretion there. Section 4 says that the criteria for investments is based on suitability and diversity. In other words, not putting all of your eggs into one basket, but spreading out the risk as much as they certainly should do so. And suitability kind of comes back to the idea that we mentioned earlier about whether it's sort of the trust where you should make a low risk investment or maybe it's something where you should be making a high risk investment. Section 5 talks about um, considering and obtaining advice, which is pretty similar to what we've already talked to. Uh, talked about in the context of Pitt and Holt, so definitely something that's now represented in statute as well. Let's move on to some of the powers though, and it's important to say that because these have a lesser status, in other words, like we said right at the start, these are essentially optional, um, they can actually be excluded by the trust instrument. So the first one that we're talking about here, which is the power of maintenance under Section 31 of the 1925 Act, it would certainly be possible that um, maintenance, the power of maintenance is excluded by the trust instrument and that would be allowed even though it sort of essentially goes against what is in the statute. So you mentioned maintenance there, what do we actually mean by this? Well this is money that's paid out from the trust to a parent or guardian of a child beneficiary and that's for their maintenance, education or general benefit. And so it might be something like a school trip or something like that just to pay for their schooling or music lessons and maintenance can be paid out of a trust to a parent or guardian to support that. Meanwhile, under Section 32, we also have the trustees have the power to advance capital money to any beneficiary for that person's benefit. And so we're no longer dealing with just simply with child beneficiaries in this situation. This may be an adult beneficiary who, for example, is wanting to start a business, and so they want a lump sum of money paid out of the trust instead of having to go out and maybe get a business loan or something like that. So that power exists under Section 32, although as we say, um, anyone with a prior life interest does have to consent as per Section 32 c Meanwhile, benefit is given a broad interpretation, so it doesn't necessarily just have to be 
a financial benefit can just be of a general benefit to that person. Maybe that the person wants to go on a gap year on a round the world trip, and if that's considered to be a benefit to them, then um, that will generally be allowed. Section 8 of the 2000 Act offers trustees the power to buy land, which is relatively broad and they're allowed to do that. And meanwhile, um, there is also another power, which is in relation to delegation, and the trustee can delegate decisions except for those which relate to the distribution of assets. In other words, which beneficiaries get which money or property, the payment of fees from income or capital of the trust. In other words, if, um, say, um, fees, certain lawyers' fees have to be paid, or like we were talking about with experts, if they have to pay the experts and that has to come out of the trust money, then that is a decision that should be made by the trustee. Appointment of new trustees also has to be obviously made by existing trustees rather than a delegated person. And any further sub-delegation is also not really possible. It's something uh, only the trustee can actually delegate. Finally, it's really important just to quickly mention about the possibility of excluding liability because this is really powerful and something that trust, a lot of trust instruments will now include. Because the trust instrument itself can exclude a great deal of liability for loss or damage which is actually caused by the trustee. In other words, even though throughout this whole lecture we've talked about the various powers and duties that the trustee has to abide by, if the trustee basically messes up and causes a significant amount of loss or damage, then under the case of Armitage and Nurse from 1998, as long as that liability is excluded within the trust instrument itself, then they will avoid all liability for doing so. And so this is quite a popular topic for essay questions, as I'll mention in the conclusion. However, now all we need to really say is that um, while this covers sort of negligence and loss and damages, if there is a loss which is caused by fraud, then that is not going to be something which can be um, excluded for in terms of liability. The powers and duties of trustees is likely to come up as part of an essay question. In particular, you might be asked to think about the recent case of Pitt and Holt, and therefore you would want to think about the previous case law as well as the decision in Pitt and Holt and then come to a conclusion based on whether you think the courts should get involved in trying to rectify mistakes that come about as the result of bad advice. One of the other popular essay questions is related to the liability of trustees, and in particular whether it should be so easy for trustees to avoid liability for loss or damage that they cause. On the one hand, trustees do volunteer for this role, and therefore if they write something into the contract that allows them to avoid liability, then perhaps that should be their prerogative. On the other hand, they are dealing with other people's money and property, and therefore maybe they should be held to a higher standard. If this does come up as part of a problem question, then it's important that you remember the ideas of duties and powers that we discussed right at the start of this lecture. In particular, while someone might have a duty to do something, how they do it is probably up to their discretion, and as long as they do it in good faith, then that is probably going to be good enough for the courts. On the other hand, you may decide on the balance of probabilities that the person has acted in bad faith, and therefore the trust should be rectified by the courts, and that might be done by something like a variation of trusts. OK, well that's all from me for this lecture. If you did enjoy the video, then make sure to leave a like, subscribe for more videos in the future, and if you've got any questions or comments, then leave those below and I'll try and get back to you. That's all from me, so bye!